Good morning. Wanted to say hello to everyone at each of our campuses at Olathe Blue Valley Lee Summit and here at Overland Park. And man, what a beautiful spring weekend. We got to enjoy this, these beautiful mornings while they last. Um, well, we are starting a new series on the book of Jonah, and I'd love for you to open your Bibles. Um, if you've never, if, if you've kind of flipped, do the flip through method, you're probably going to miss it because it's only two pages. And so the best way to find Jonah in your Bible, I think, is to open to the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew and flip back a couple pages. And hopefully you find it there. So, or you could use the table of contents, you know. Um, so that's a way to do it as well. But here's what it says. We're going to start with Jonah chapter 1, uh, starting with verse 1. And here's what it, it reads. This, uh, this is the, the word of the Lord here. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Rise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against her, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So during the month of May, we're going to be studying the book of Jonah. If you grew up in church, you're familiar with this story because it's one of the most popular children's Bible stories. But the book of Jonah is a part of a collection of writings in the Bible called the Prophets, and more specifically called the Minor Prophets. There there are four major prophets, which is Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and there's there's about 12 Minor Prophets. And so the reason they're called the Minor Prophets has nothing to do with the importance of the books, um, but has, it's because they're shorter. So these are equally as important as the Major Prophets. They're just a lot shorter than the Major Prophets. But the unique thing about the book of Jonah is that it's, in this book we see all the other prophets they have, kind of they, they'll be the pronouncements of the prophet or the teachings of the prophet or the oracles or the sayings. But in the book of Jonah, his pronouncements are actually very few. In fact, it's only one sentence, his sermon. And so the book of Jonah gives us the story of this prophet Jonah. Uh, And that's what we're going to talk about is this extraordinary situation that this guy finds himself in. But one of the things I love about the prophetic books is that often they are speaking about specific historical situations. And so these are examples of how God uses human messengers and human circumstances rooted in a concrete historical situation and reality to communicate his message to the world. That's what the prophets are. So a little bit of background about Jonah. Jonah was a contemporary of the prophet Elisha, the major prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha, very famous prophets talked about in the book of 1 and 2 Kings. In those books, there's a, a, a lot of people think that Jonah was a part of this group called the Sons of the Prophets. If you read First and Second Kings, there's this group of young men that would follow around Elijah and Elisha, and, and they were kind of disciples of the prophets. And so this phrase is repeated over and over again. And so a lot of people, judging by the chronology, assume that Jonah was probably a member of this group that was invested and poured into by the prophets Elijah and Elisha. The story of Jonah is a very fantastic story. I learned about it as a kid, and all I remember is talking about the whale, right? That's the first thing that comes to mind for most of us is the fish. And if you're kind of a skeptic towards Christianity and towards the Bible, uh, if you're not careful, you'll allow the fish to cause you to dismiss this story as mythology. But I'd encourage you to open your mind and your heart and not to get caught up on the fish, Uh, For those of you that are somewhat familiar with the story, because the story is not about the fish. In fact, the fish only appears twice. The story is about something far more penetrating and far deeper, and so don't get caught up on the fish. I read something today that said, that fish is the most criticized fish that ever swam the Mediterranean Sea. (laughs) And so here's a little bit of the the outline of the the book of Jonah, and I got this from Tim Keller's book, The Prodigal Prophet. I loved his outline there. He divides the first part of the book into, it's really two major parts. The first part is Jonah chapter 1 and 2, which is titled Jonah and the Sea. Jonah and the Sea. And chapters 3 and 4 is called Jonah and the City. In both of these settings, Jonah encounters three different things. He has an encounter with God's Word. At the, in the sea and in the city. He has an encounter with God's 
world in the sea and the city and the ocean. He encounters the pagan sailors from the world and in the city he encounters the, the Ninevites. And Jonah also has an encounter in both of these sections with God's grace. God, Jonah's response to the, God's word, Jonah's response to God's world, and Jonah's response to God's grace. These are the encounters he has in each of these parts of this book. It's a very a tightly organized, the, the language is very terse and minimal. And so th- this is just a brilliant piece of literature that we're going to study. But the book is about this collision between God's mercy and God's judgment that's what lies at the heart of this story. And, and, you know, we have all this evidence to suggest that during the time that Jonah prophesied, the nation of Israel had been consumed with these nationalistic ambitions to restore the borders of the promised land that God had given them. And so we have a lot of reason to, to infer that Israel had kind of created a God in its own image that existed to serve its own political ambitions. And when Jonah, a prophet that is very uh, pro-Israel, pro-nationalistic with Israel, when he encounters the real God, the God of Scripture, he has no categories for how to respond to that God. And so that's what we're going to do. He's totally unprepared for what God calls him to do. There's many people that have observed in the first book, we're, gonna, we're going to see Jonah given a task that he did not want to do, and so he chose to, att- to attempt to run away from God, which is kind of funny, right? How can you run away from God? But in the second part of the book, Jonah is going to run away from God in a very different way through begrudging obedience. In the first part, he runs away through disobedience. In the second part of the book, he runs away from God through begrudging obedience. It's two ways from running away from God that we're going to deal with in this book. And so we're going to be invited alongside Jonah to encounter the real God, the God of Scripture. And this God that exists to serve our own agendas and our political ambitions is going to be confronted with the real God. And so we're going to see how all of us respond as well alongside Jonah in this book. So let's talk about the story. Let's get into this story. We're just going to deal with the first four verses today. But number one, if I were to kind of title the first part of this story, I'd say the person of Jonah. Let's talk about the person of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Who is Jonah? He's only mentioned one other time in the Bible. The fact that he's not explained tells us that the author probably assumed his audience already knew who this guy was. And so we can infer that Jonah was none other than the prophet that was mentioned in 2 Kings. During the reign of King Jeroboam II, this is probably somewhere around 793 B.C. to about 753 B.C., the prophet Jonah. 2 Kings 14.25 is the only other time he's mentioned in the Bible. And there, in that verse, we learn that Jonah supported King Jeroboam's aggressive military policy of expansion to extend the nation's power and influence. By contrast, the prophets Amos and Hosea, who were contemporary to Jonah, they prophesied during the same time, criticized the royal administration for its lack of justice and unfaithfulness to God. And it is for this reason that one commentator described Jonah like this. He says, Jonah, Leslie Allen writes, Jonah would have been remembered by the original readers as an intensely patriotic, highly partisan nationalist. We also have to keep in mind, before we get too judgmental of Jonah in the first couple verses here, that Jonah was a prophet of God. Apparently he was a prophet who was pretty successful. People listened to what he said. He had sermons that were preached that the nation listened to. The king listened to his message and followed through with it. And it says that in 2 Kings chapter 14, it says right there that according to the word of the Lord spoken by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the borders of Israel were restored under King Jeroboam II. He had a generally successful prophetic ministry. People listened to his preaching. The king looked on him with favor. And so here, I think, is the first lesson that we learn from the person of Jonah. Is that neither past privilege, nor past faithfulness, nor past fruitfulness can substitute for present obedience to the Lord. No matter what kind of successful ministry he had in the past and, or how righteous you think you are, don't get so comfortable in your faith that you stop listening to God. 
We're to continually hear and obey the word of the Lord so that we will not be like those who stand before Christ someday to whom he says, we say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many mighty works in your name? And he will say to those people, depart from me for I never knew you. So that's the person of Jonah. That's all we know about him. Number two here, we have the the call of Jonah. The call of Jonah, verse 1, records the command of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, and he said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has risen up before me. In the Hebrew, it's literally, it's risen up before my face. That phrase, the word of the Lord came to, is, is a phrase that's used a hundred times in the Old Testament. It's, it call, it, it, it's a phrase that refers to the call of the prophets. And this is the language that, in our cultures, many times it's abused, right? You, you hear people that say, well, God told me this, or God told me that, or I, I, I have a sense of peace about this, and so it must be God. Or I have an emotional reaction to these circumstances in my life, and so I think that's the Lord speaking to me. You hear people abuse this language all the time. But in the Bible, the phrase, the word of the Lord came to, was a phenomenal experience. In fact, the prophets describe it in several different ways. They describe it as a sword that pierces the soul, a burden upon the shoulders, a fire raging within, a hammer that shatters rock into pieces, a bitter tasting morsel. When God's word comes upon a person in the Bible, it is an awesome, overwhelming experience. And this undoubtedly must have been what had happened to Jonah. We don't know what exactly happened. But it was so overwhelming an experience that there was no denial that this was the word of the Lord. And first of all, God's word came. I love that word came. That word's pretty huge. The word of God came to Jonah. It could not be halted or stopped. It could not be predicted or planned for. It could not be manufactured or made up. God's word came at him. It seized his mind and heart. It was undeniable. Secondly, God's word came to Jonah with clarity. He says, rise, go to Nineveh. Very specific call of God. Go to Nineveh. And so God's word came with clarity. It's the Hebrew here, when he says rise and go, the Hebrew word is the phrase kum lek, which we're going to come back to. That's an important phrase in the book of Jonah. And this is a very specific call to go to this specific city from the Lord. It came with clarity. It came to Jonah with a note of reality. He says, go to Nineveh, that great city. It's specific. Jonah would have known how big Nineveh was. It's a very huge city in the ancient world. And later we're told that Nineveh was three days' journey to, to travel through it. How far can you walk in a day? For me, it's about 10 miles, and then I start to, to get tired, and my feet start to hurt. So how big was this city? 30 miles across? God's word came to to Jonah with clarity. It came to Jonah with a note of reality. It also came to Jonah with a heavy responsibility. It is difficult for us to imagine how the, the responsibility that God gave to this Hebrew prophet when he says to cry out against her because her wickedness has risen up before my face. This is shocking for a number of reasons. First of all, no Hebrew prophet had ever been sent to a foreign nation I mean, certainly they had oracles about the foreign nations in other prophetic books, but no Hebrew prophet had ever been asked to actually go into these countries. This mission from God was truly unprecedented. God's word came with reality and clarity and responsibility, and that also means that Jonah understood exactly what God wanted him to do. His difficulty was not intellectual. He did not need to consult commentaries. He did not need more historical background. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do. His difficulty was not intellectual, and neither is ours, by the way, most of the time. Jonah's difficulty was moral. Because what God was asking him to do was putting his will on a direct collision course with the will of God. It's a heavy responsibility It is equally shocking that God would call Jonah to warn Nineveh. Nineveh is in modern modern day Iraq. It is, uh, in those days, it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, Assyria was a mortal enemy of the nation of Israel in the north. And it's easy for us to miss the significance of what God is asking Jonah to do because Nineveh was about 600 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a 600-mile journey, and 
It endured for nearly a thousand years. It was one of the largest cities in the ancient world during Sennacherib reign. Nineveh became the chief royal city of the Assyrian Empire. Eventually it was destroyed by the Medes in 612 BC. And then it was taken over by the Babylonians soon after. But in Israel's imagination, Nineveh became the symbol of wickedness and evil. We also know from history that, Nine- uh, that Assyria was an uncharacteristically violent empire. Assyrian kings would record their military victories in brutal graphic detail. Assyrian war reliefs that have been recovered, actually there's a museum in London that has some of these war reliefs in stone. It shows their victims being tortured and dismembered. It shows them playing catch with decapitated heads. In fact, one tradition we have shows the Assyrian Empire, when they would conquer a city, they would cut off the limbs of their, their, uh, the people that they would conquer, but they would leave one arm so that they could shake the hand of the people that they conquered. One commentator said that Assyrian history is as gory and blood-curdling a history as we know. Another Bible scholar said that Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire could be described as a terrorist state. The prophet Nahum spoke of the wickedness of Nineveh uh, shortly after the time of Jonah. And here's what he writes. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, the crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse, bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing swords, glittering spears, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead body without end. They stumble over the bodies and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her sorcery. So God looks down on the city of Nineveh and he's furious about what's going on in the walls of the city. And so he selects his man Jonah and speaks to him to go into the city of Nineveh and announce her impending doom. That's the call of Jonah. Here's number two. It's the, pretty surprising here what happens next for a Hebrew prophet. Verse three tells us the, shows us the flight of Jonah. God's command to Jonah was rise. Kum lek, go to Nineveh. Rise, go. Verse 3 begins with the words, so Jonah rose. So good so far, right? Jonah rose, so he, he starts out in obedience. He obeys the first part of the Lord's command. And then it says, it's ironic all the more when Jonah rose to flee where? To Tarshish. Whoa, record scratch. Away from the presence of the Lord. The Hebrew word there is away from the face of the Lord. This is accentuated by the fact that says that Jonah, the text tells us that Jonah went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. And the phrase is repeated, away from the face, away from the presence of the Lord. We don't exactly know where Tarshish was located, but there seems to be consensus amongst biblical scholars that it was in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. Uh, Many scholars say that Tarshish was on the coast of Spain. And if that's true, it's about, what is it, 2,500 miles from Jerusalem in the opposite direction, over sea. Called to the heart of the big city, Jonah runs to the edge of the known world. Nineveh is east, Tarshish is west. Nineveh is over the land. Tarshish is across to the sea. In the biblical imagination, Tarshish was a place, it was kind of a distant paradise. If you think of all the cities of mythology, like the lost city of Atlantis or Shangri-La, or like these paradises, these mythological paradises. That's what Tarshish was in the biblical imagination. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 22, King Solomon actually had ships brought in from Tarshish every three years, filled with gold, silvery, ivory, Gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Isn't that kind of funny? Like Solomon sitting around his palace. Like, you know what would make this place really nice? (laughs) Tarshish is where people go who want to halfway obey God without having to deal with him. Eugene Peterson points this out. Jonah uses the command of the Lord to avoid the presence of the Lord. He sets out in quasi-obedience and boards a ship headed to Tarshish. And this is where we are going to leave off. 
our story for this week. I'm not going to talk about it any further. That's end of the story. It's the call of Jonah. And I think in light of this weekend being graduate weekend at our church and people in these major life transitions going into adulthood especially, but I think this is for all of us, there's four questions that I would like to ask as we draw to a close for our passage today. Four questions I want you to think about this week. Especially those of you that are graduates and moving on into the next season of life. Question number one from this, this call of Jonah. Does God know what's best or do we? Why did Jonah run? At this point, we're not exactly told the real reason yet, but we're invited to make some guesses. The mission God gave to Jonah was not very practical. I mean, who's to think this would even work? Could you imagine going to a Jewish rabbi in 1941 and saying go to the heart of Berlin and call publicly call upon Nazi Germany to repent how do you think that would have gone over it's not very practical I imagine Jonah thinking Lord it'll never work I can't believe you told me to do this this is just stupid it's never going to work it's not practical I'm, I'm, I'm okay with doing whatever you want me to do but let's just do let's be wise about this let's be smart about this God, it's kind of humorous when you imagine the conversation that way, isn't it? The scary thing about this is that we can always rationalize our way out of obeying the call of God. The pull uh, towards self-centered living for all of us is so strong that literally we can come up with a million reasons not to obey God that will be culturally embraced by people around us. I recently read the book, The Gulag Archipelago, by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and it's kind of his memoir talking about a post-World War II Soviet Russia, and it's pretty amazing to read because they just started arresting everybody and throwing them in prison, and nobody wanted to be viewed as anti-government, nobody wanted to be seen as that, and so here's what he says in his book. It ex- it, his book explores the passivity of the average citizen in post-World War II Soviet Russia. He's just bewildered by the passivity of everyone in the face of this extraordinary, extraordinarily wicked regime. And he says, every man always has a handy does- dozen glib little reasons why he is right not to sacrifice himself. We can always, under the guise of being practical, rationalize our way out of the life that God is calling us to. You hear people do this with morality, that say, well, it's totally okay for me to sleep with my boyfriend or girlfriend because we human beings were wired for connection. Why would God give me these desires if he didn't want me to act out on them? It's okay for me to divorce my my wife, because she's not meeting my needs anymore. So there's the question. Does God know what's best, or do we? Does God know what's best when it comes to your sexuality, or do you? Does God know what's best when it's come to your finances, or do do you? Does God know what's best when it comes to our relationships, our vocation, and our future, Or do we? It seems like a really silly question, doesn't it? But yet all of us wrestle with this question every single day. Jesus told the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. Maybe you hear this command and you're like, Lord, you have no idea. That's never going to work. I'm going to go and share my faith with people and they're not going to respond. I've tried this before. It doesn't work. This is not practical. Nobody's going to listen to me. But this thinking reveals this lack of trust. In the reality that God is infinitely wiser than us, that God knows what's best, and he who has commanded us to do something is able to equip us and empower us for that task. Jonah, as we're going to discover, was ultimately unwilling to submit to God's will in his life. And so will you be like Jonah, or will you trust that God knows what's best? Question number two. From this short few verses. Have I lost sight of God's mission? 
for my life. Judging from the biblical data, it appears that Jonah's flight to Tarshish is an abandonment of a once true mission. He was a prophet of the Lord with a successful ministry. Um, the, the author John Ortberg, one of my favorite Christian authors, he wrote a book called Overcoming Your Shadow Mission. And here's what he writes in his book. He says, whatever we choose over God's mission for us is, is our shadow mission. And then he writes, you and I were created to have a mission in life. We were made to make a difference. But if we do not pursue the mission for which God designed and gifted us, you, we will find a substitute. We cannot live in the absence of purpose. Without an authentic mission, we will be tempted to drift on autopilot to let our lives center around something that is unworthy, something selfish, and something dark, a shadow mission. John Ortberg then goes on to tell a story about he took the men in his church up into the mountains in California for a men's retreat, and they talk, were talking about this idea of the shadow mission. And he said in the middle of the retreat, one of the men stood up to everyone's surprise and had this outburst of confession. And he looked at everyone and he said, my shadow mission is to sit on the couch, watch pornography, and play video games while the world goes to hell. He says there was a nervous chuckle amongst the men in the room. They thought he was kind of joking and, and they thought it was kind of funny that he had the audacity to mention that. And then the man looked at everyone in the room and he says, I'm going to say that one more time and I want you to listen to what I just said without laughing. My shadow mission is to sit on the couch and watch pornography and play video games while the world goes to hell. He said all the men in the room started weeping. And one by one they stood and they shared their shadow missions of their own. Your shadow mission is whatever you busy yourself doing while the world goes to hell. It is an authentic mission for life that has been derailed. And what makes it so tempting is that sometimes it is so closely related to our gifts and our abilities. It's not like God's calling Jonah to quit his job and go to a totally different career. He's calling him to go and do what he does what he does well, apparently, in Nineveh. But Jonah flees to Tarshish, and so the question is, what is the shadow mission in your life? What do you busy yourself doing with a complete lack of concern that the rest of the world is going to hell? If you flip your life on autopilot, what are the things that you run to or the places that you run to in order to get away from God? What is your Tarshish? It could be kids or family or sports or success or the internet or alcohol or medication. Whatever you have taken in exchange for the presence of God in your life or wherever you live apart from God, that is your shadow mission. That's your Tarshish. Have you abandoned or lost sight of God's mission for your life? Question number three. Do you run away from God in disobedience Rebellious disobedience or in begrudging obedience? That's the really shocking part of this story for many people. In chapters 1 and 2, Jonah disobediently runs away from the presence of God. In chapters 3 and 4, Jonah obeys, but he does so with a heart filled with fury. Jonah does not have the intellectual categories to make space for a God that would have mercy on Nineveh. And here's why Eugene Peterson writes this, Jonah was worse obedient than he was disobedient. If he cannot go to Tarshish where he can continue to be a prophet away from the presence of the Lord, then he will prophesy with dogmatism and hatred in his heart in Nineveh even while he avoids living in the presence of God. As the VeggieTales song says, Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh, but he really never got it, ooh, ooh. I've actually never seen the movie, but that's what I'm told. And I watched the YouTube video this week. Jonah is arresting because it reminds us that there's two ways of getting away from God. One is through disobedience. The other is through obedience with, for the wrong reasons. Are you currently living in disobedience in any area of your life? Is there any resentment for God underneath your scrupulous obedience? Here's the last question that I want to draw to a close with. 
that I think is really at the heart of the story as we're going to discover in the coming weeks. Is God really just and good? God's call to Jonah must not have only seemed impractical, it also must have seemed theologically bewildering because why would God ask Jonah to cry out to Nineveh if there was not a chance at Nineveh repenting? That's why Jonah's mad in the later part of the book. Uh, in, in, the, in the early part of the book, that's why he runs away. Chapter 4 tells us why Jonah ran. He says, Oh Lord, is this not what I said to you when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious God mer- and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah knew that God was forgiving and he did not want God to forgive the Ninevites. How could a good God give mercy to Nineveh? After all the wickedness and violence that she committed against the people of God, and shortly after the time of Jonah, Nineveh and Assyria would invade and take over Samaria and do the same thing to Israel that they had done to everyone else. Violent conquest. Is God really just and good if he wants to forgive those people? I think when we get really honest with ourselves, it's amazing how much hatred we have lurking under the surface in our hearts for people that are different from us or towards people that have wronged us. And we have some residual hatred deep within. And I think if we're honest with it, I heard somebody say it this way, uh, the most offensive thing about God is when you discover who he has chosen to forgive. Probably the most scandalous moment for many people in their spiritual journey is when you arrive in heaven someday and you see who's standing there in line. Scandalous. Someone once said, you know that you've created a God in your own image when you discover that that God hates all the same people that you hate. How could a just God forgive the Ninevites? How could a just God allow wickedness to go unpunished? How could a good God allow suffering to happen? These questions remain unanswered in the book of Jonah. And yet they are posed in all of their severity. But in the grand narrative of Scripture, for those of us that know the larger story, the answer to these questions will drive us to the cross of Jesus Christ. The heart of the Christian gospel, where the one who called himself the true Jonah was swallowed up by the earth and swallowed up by sin and death, and he spent three days and three nights in the ground so that the justice and mercy of God could both be satisfied. The reason we're studying Jonah is because the closer we get to know the prophet Jonah, the more intensely we are driven to the true Jonah, which is Jesus Christ, who faithfully followed God's call into the wicked world, into the wicked city. He faithfully, he wasn't disobedient. He did not run away from the call of God, but he was obedient to death itself. He faithfully followed God's call into a world that was filled with sinners like you and I, laying down his life to restore us to the presence of God. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this call of Jonah. Pray for everybody that's here today at Legacy Christian Church. I pray that you would shine the light of your spirit into our hearts and show us the ways that are are, that we're pursuing missions that are not your mission for us. Show us the strategies that we use to run away from you. Break down the prison of self-rationalizations that we have for not being obedient to your call and help us to cast our gaze to the true Jonah who laid down his life for all of us and obediently followed your call. In Jesus' name, amen.